Will you turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 16? And I surely, I, I know sometimes we come into the house of the Lord or log on the e-church platform. And um, you and I do know that we are blessed with an awesome worship team, with musicians who love God. Who are, we want you guys to know we celebrate your commitment. Here's, now, sometimes even when a young musician loves God and wants to play for God and wants to be a blessing to the kingdom, you can never imagine the different ways the enemy would try. Sometimes the devil waves offers. Sometimes the devil tells you, you know, you could take those talent and you could use it for the enemy and earn funds that you and I could only dream of. But when all is said and done, there is absolutely nothing that can replace being a part of what God is doing. And so we salute our musicians and salute the worship team for their obedience to God and for saying no even when the devil would wave lures before them. Genesis chapter 16 and while you're looking for that passage, I want to remind you because as Sister Jackie reminded us, spring is here. And one of the ways that we want to be a blessing to our community, the women's ministry will be giving away Mother's Day gift baskets on Saturday 23rd to the women residing in the EUMC Towers. So we want to invite all of our members and friends. You can participate by donating gift baskets or gift basket items, baths and body works, etc., or cash towards this cause. And we want to be a blessing to these mothers. And uh, why this is so important? Because it ties right in with the word today. Over the past weeks, we've been looking at the family. A reminder that in God's sight and in God's plan, the family is the means by which the faith passes from one generation to the next. I mean, God ordained the family. The family was, is, is not a social construct that um, came out of the, 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 the design of men to order society. Instead, it was God's plan from the beginning. So God created a man named Adam, gave him a partner named Eve, and out of that union, raised up a family. Now, uh, I, we're living in confused times. And if we don't teach our children the word of the Lord, then they will assume that what's happening around us is okay in the eyes of God. So if a man can change his gender and participate in a woman's sport or event and wins the event, and we celebrate a man, a biological male, who just won a woman's event. That is not only abnormal, it goes against the word of scripture. And we have got to know the word as believers. No, I want you to understand that it means that we know, we stand upon the word of the Lord. I still believe in respecting the choices of people. I still believe in respecting even when I disagree. But that when all is said and done, it is important for us and our children to know what thus says the Lord. Yes. So over the past weeks, as we have looked at the family, we've looked at the fact we're building the foundation. Because the enemy is not worried about your body in the church building. If you think... The devil is having a headache right now because you're in the building? No, honey. Because your body can be in the building, but you are losing the battle at home. 
And so what the devil will try to do is to, um, who is to cause the foundation of the family to crumble. So we looked at the word of God and where the scripture reminds us the value of rebuilding the foundation. We also know that even as Christian couples, there are times when the, the joy can go. I, I, I hope I'm talking to some honest people who can say, you know, there are times when you are not feeling it, but you still do it anyway. Because your marriage has little to do with your feelings. It has everything to do with your commitment. So when we talked about what happens, what, what do we do when the wine runs out? You got to make some cider juice or something. But never allow. And, and I want you to understand. You, don't have, you have no idea how long you both may live. So don't try to wait out each other. Love each other. Forgive each other. Keep the wine in the midst. And, and, and so um, we also looked at what does it mean when we are called to live out a reality we were denied. Because... Every couple brings their own baggage into the marriage. And so what do we do when we were denied certain grace growing up? And now in a marriage, we're expected to live out what we were denied. Then, of course, last week we looked at what happens when the covenant crumbles. You can be a good believer. You can love God and still go through a divorce. And so for years, the church didn't know how to handle divorce. And so you could be a murderer. You could be a mass murderer. You could go serve time in prison. And then you get converted. And the church says, what a God. Look what God has done in this man or woman. But then somebody who is divorced, what do we do? Without telling them without verbalizing it, we treat them as second-class citizens. So, without knowing the facts, whether they're innocent or the guilty partner, the church has just put divorced people in one category. And, and, and many times the message we've given to folks is because you have gone through the misfortune of a divorce. God can't use you. It's a lie from the pits of hell. I want you to know that even if the covenant crumbled, God can still restore. Even if you have gone through a divorce, it is not over. And stop believing the lie that because your marriage fell apart, that your future fell apart. Oh, God can pull you out, honey, out of the ashes. And he can do something in your life that makes your future look unimaginable it's God who is still working well today we're going to be looking at what happens when you happen to solo parent or be a single parent next week God's willing uh, singles next week is your week I hear it. And, and, and I don't care how old you are you could be 90 years old in a nursing home and if you still feel like you have some life go ahead and get married and stop and don't be embarrassed don't no no so Genesis chapter 16 now Sarah Abraham's wife bear him no children and she had a handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar and Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, going unto my maid, it may be that I may obtain children by her. Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah, and Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, Abram to be his wife. He went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid unto your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in your hands. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar 
by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he says, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence comest thou? And whither goest thou? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit yourself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, and it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, now thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seest me? Wherefore the well was called Berla Harai Oi, because, or behold, it is between Kadesh and bear it. Our Father, we humble our hearts before you today, grateful for your mercies, grateful for who you are, grateful that the God of eternity would take concern in our welfare. Now this morning I pray you'll speak to our hearts. Do for the for us what only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you for the next few moments. There's a drama. Now, before children became addicted to technology, before iPad, iPod, iPhone, before Wi-Fi, before children had phones and parents would give them a quarter for a phone call. That was really a long time ago. Now, children walk into our homes and the first question they ask, what's the password for the Wi-Fi? They asked a young boy, what was, your, what was your favorite subject in school? He replied, recess. <laughs> Some of us have no idea what recess is. <laughs> that was the break during the middle of the day when kids could just run and be healthy. Well, when we were children, we had to create our own games. Yes. And our own entertainment. And one of the games we would play was hide and seek. This was a popular children's game in which one player closes his or her eyes for a period, oftentimes counting to 100 with their eyes closed. This would give their friends time to hide. And then they would now have to search and find their friends. After they found their, their, their friend in the hiding place, then they would keep a joint force and begin to search for the others. And the one who was found last was the winner. Well, the truth is, when we were raised in, in, um, in Sunday school, most times our Sunday school teachers made such a strong emphasis on the fact that God can see everywhere, everyone at the same time. And so it was impressed upon us many times to do right. One of the songs they taught us around that time, be careful what you do. Oh, some of you have never heard that song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For there's a father up above. Oh, you are in the same Sunday school. Looking down in tender love. Be careful, little eyes. <laughs> then be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little tongue, what you speak. Be careful, little hands what you do and be careful of the feet <laughs> the whole idea was they wanted to teach us to be responsible in making the right decision whether based on what we see hear say touch or do and that is true we should be we, we it is important that we are taught that our actions do have consequences on the other side we oftentimes overemphasize one aspect and miss the other side completely. 
Because yes, my friends, in Proverbs chapter 15 and 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and on the good. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 13 and 14. He sees what is behind and what is ahead, all the threats, all the dangers, and God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. So right from the foundation, we got an awareness of the dimensions of God. They would teach us, number one, God is omnipotent. That means God is omnip God is all powerful. And then they would tell us now God is omnipresent. That means God is, is just as much in Brooklyn as he is in Sydney. And that God is omniscient. God knows everything. Not only what you said, but what you thought about. <laughs> now that just got somebody. So, so after Adam and Eve sinned, the natural inclination after you have done wrong is to hide. So Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they hid from God. And so the Bible says when God showed up in the cool of the day and cried, Adam, where was thou? How can you hide from God? Behind the tree that God created. Because there's nowhere you can go that God can't see you. And I want us to know that regardless of your state in life and regardless of the hand you are dealt with, God sees. Not only when you're going through the issues, but God sees ahead. You see, God has a prevision. That's why Abraham, when God told Abraham to go up and to offer his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, you remember that when Abraham got instruction, he got up early, took his son, and he went on the journey. And when he got to a certain point, he said to the servants, you stay right here because the boy and I are going up yonder to worship. You've got to understand anytime God asks you for something, you can trust him. <laughs> oh my God. See, God was telling him to go up to Mount Moriah and offer the boy a sacrifice. But Abraham knew that if God had promised him to do something through the boy. It then means even if the boy died, God would bring him back to life because Abraham knew how to trust God. So the idea is that even as uh, uh, Abraham is on the way up the side of the mountain to offer Isaac, the Bible says when he got to the top of the mountain, he now lays out the altar Builds the altar, takes the wood, and he builds the altar. <laughs> it's amazing because while they're walking up the mountain, Isaac, who had seen his father worship before, said, Dad, there's something, there's a problem. What's the problem, son? He says, I see the wood, <laughs> I see the fire, but you have never worshipped with altar sacrifice. And Abraham says, just keep walking. <laughs> We're making it up. Because God is faithful. And so here's what happens is when they get up to the top of the mountain, they build the altar. And, and Abraham now takes Isaac, puts him on the altar. And the Bible says when he raised his hand, God spoke to him. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. Literally stopped him. And he says, no, you don't have to follow through. Because now you have shown. It's one thing to say you have faith. It's one thing to say I trust God. It's a different thing when you got now call to obey God. And the Bible says, and he, he saw a ram caught in the thicket. He took his son off the altar. He grabbed that ram, put the ram on the altar, and he offered the, the ram to God, and he named the place, he named the place Jehovah Jireh. Now here's what happens because the interesting thing, the word Jireh, Jireh, Jireh means, um, two, it, can be, it can mean two things. It can mean vision or it can mean provision. And so when he says, God, thou art Jehovah Jireh, what he's really saying is, you now have shown to me you are a provider. But God is not like a husband who sees the refrigerator empty and goes to Costco and shop. No, huh? no, no, no. The husband got to see it empty. Well, 
<laughs> He's got to see it empty before he goes to shop. You see, the idea is God sees your need before you are aware of your need. <laughs> so when, 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 when Abraham didn't know is that as he was walking up one side of the mountain to the place of obedience, the provision was walking up the other side of the mountain. And I want you to know at the right place, they came together. Not so the word Jehovah, Jireh, Jireh, Jireh. The word Jireh means provision and it means vision. Now, why, how do you not bring? Because you see the idea is pre, the prefix means before. And because God has a prevision, he makes a provision. Oh, that just missed somebody this morning. I want you to know whatever you're facing today, God already saw it. God has already made a provision. He's just gonna He's just gonna bring the prevision with the provision. And when you walk away, you know God is faithful. Now here we are. So before all of that, Abraham and his wife Sarah have a problem. The problem was God says, look, I'm going to bless you guys and I'm going to bless you through a son and the world will be blessed and your seed will multiply in such dimension beyond numbers. Of course, after waiting for a while, after waiting for a while, they did what most of us do. When God doesn't show up on time, we come up with our own plans. So Sarah did something that was quite unusual. She says, Abraham, if God has blessed us and I can't have children, well, I'm going to give you my servant girl. And when she has the child, I'll raise the child. That's the first case of surrogate motherhood. The problem is, now that sounded good until one day, after, after Hagar is pulled into a transaction that she has no power. She never seduced Abraham. She never messed, uh, tried to break up his marriage. She was minding her own business, serving Sarah, and she was pulled into somebody else's situation. And so here's what happens. Says one day, um, Hagar says to Sarah, I think it happened. Well, of course, you know, with the pregnancy, you can only go for so long before it starts showing. And so Hagar is now walking around the house with the big dress on. <laughs> now, now, here's the amazing thing. Because Hagar was the servant. Hagar was serving Sarah. But after Hagar got pregnant, Sarah is now the one saying, Hagar, are you okay? Do you, does the baby need anything? Do you, I mean, but I'm sure because you know, uh, okay. Uh, and, and so now that she's pregnant, I'm sure Sarah's like, maybe you need to sit down. Don't work so hard. We're going to make sure the baby comes out okay. And so here's what happens. Then one day, and, and, and probably, I mean, I, I, I think sometimes when we read scripture, we forget the people in scripture are human beings just like us. So it, it's not unusual, I'm sure, that one day um, Hagar just kind of struts a little around the house, feeling very important because she's now carrying in her mind the promise. And so what happens is one day Sarah says, I can't handle this woman anymore. Abraham, get her out of the house. Of course, Abraham, most men are like, I'm staying out of the middle of that. Uh, whatever you want to do, you do it. And so Sarah sends Hagar away. This woman who is now with child, who is caught up in a situation which was not of her doing, finds herself kicked out with nowhere to go. And the Bible says, and she goes out in the wilderness, and she, I mean, she, she, she is nowhere she's going. She's just going about, and somewhere she gets to a place where she finds a pool, and out there feeling despondent and discouraged, feeling that her life is now completely a wreck. Who shows up? Because God has a way. 
of showing up in your dark moments. God has a way of showing up in those seasons and time when it feels as if your life is all over. And here's what God says to her. He says, uh, he says hey, God, what are you doing all here? Uh, you know, um, I had a home yesterday, but I'm kicked out. Why? Because my boss says, wife kicked me out of the house. And, and, and this is a strange passage because he says, now look here. He says, you need to go back and submit yourself. Strange. Because what God wanted her to know. Remember, Hagar was not a Hebrew. Hagar was literally an Egyptian. Hagar was an outsider of the promise. Hagar was captured as a slave girl living with Abraham. But here's what happens. Because she was a part of the right household. Even though she was dragged into a situation outside of her control. The angel says to her, look here, you can't afford to leave the place of your blessing. Now, I, I know sometimes your home feels a little painful and sometimes your situation seems impossible. But when God plants you somewhere, it means that's where your destiny is defined. And you see, what well, the problem with too many of us, we run too easy. When things don't work out, we pack our little bags and say, at least I have my dignity. I'm leaving, honey. Sometimes you got to know when to bury your dignity for the greater good. Now, you, now, don't, now I know someone is going to misconstrue that. The idea is you shouldn't tolerate disrespect and you should never lose sight of your value. But what the angel wanted Hagar to know, the promise over Abraham is now covering Hagar. Yes. Why? Yes. Because the seed in Hagar comes from Abraham. Okay. Here's what he says. He says, now yes, you're going to eat right inside. There's a boy, bouncing boy in you. And here's what happens. His name shall be called Ishmael. Because God knows where you are. And here's what happened. Here's, here's what happened. Hey, God, I want you to know that in spite of how things look today, it's not always going to be like this because God is going to raise up that seed to be a mighty nation. And here, and so when, when Hagar got the revelation, Hagar said, wait a minute. I've heard of the God of Abraham. I've heard of Jehovah, the I am that I am. But she says today, I've experienced God, not only as what I heard, but I've experienced God as the one who sees where I am. Now here's what happened, folks. There are too many believers who are going after somebody else's testimony. There are too many folks who can say, I know God because of what my mama says or what my papa said. They know God in a secondary way, but there's nothing like knowing God in a primary way that you can say, I know, I know where I was when God showed up. Now, I, I, I wish that was the end that would... would have been a nice ending that Hagar goes back home and things become peachy, but no. Because the Bible says, God came back and reminded Sarah, I still have a promise over your life. I know you're old and barren, but I still have a promise over your life. And so eventually, Sarah gives birth to Isaac. And one day, these two boys, these brothers, are playing, just do what boys do, but this time, the older one, Ishmael, seems to be teasing his younger brother, who now has the promise. And so when Sarah looks through the window and sees the step, her stepson, as it were, taking advantage of the promised child, she goes, no, 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 uh, 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 this time, both of you leaving. <clears throat> And so by the time you look in chapter 21, Hagar and her boy now find themselves evicted, thrown out on the street. And so what Abraham did, he packed a bag, put some uh, food in, and, he, and blessed her with some supplies. And now Hagar and her little boy is walking out in the wilderness again. 
Bible says, while they walked out in chapter 21, they're out in the wilderness just wandering, not knowing where to go. Came to a point when the boy became so thirsty, he, came, he became so faint that they literally, Hagar thought that he was going to die. And she forgot the first encounter. She forgot what God had said. And she got to a place that she said, oh, I think we're going to die out in the wilderness. And she took that young boy, laid him under a shrub, so at least he's protected from the sun. And she walked a distance. She could not bear to see her son die. She walked a distance and sat down just looking over the child that she gave birth to. In pain and despair. Knowing that based on how things looked, this is going to be a quick end. But who shows up again? God has a way. God shows up and reminds Hagar there is a promise over your life and there's a promise over the boy's life. And when God makes a promise over your life, not even COVID can stop God's promise. When God makes a promise over your life and unemployment, whatever devastation. And again, she was refreshed by divine intervention. You see, my friends, probably the hardest job in the world is to be a single mother. Probably the hardest job in the world is to be a parent trying to raise a child, and especially in this country, to raise a young black boy in a single parent home keeps you on your knees every day that you wake up. The idea is, because we know that the systems around us would destroy our young boys before they come into maturity. Just somehow, when that young black child is lying in the hospital, he's so cute. When you walk around with a young baby, they're so cute. But at some point, once they reach the early teenage years in this country, they're not seen as cute, they're seen as a threat. And so what happens is, for a woman to raise a young black boy in this country, a young teenager, there are some things that we need to remember because you see, to raise children as a single parent is hard, much harder. You see, a, a couple, the wife can have the luxury in most cases of at least just relaxing because she knows somebody else is holding the wheel. Well, what do you do when you are the one who's driving and you can't take your hand off for one moment? So many times single parents are left to forgetting their own welfare, doing only what is, I mean, they, it's like they go from one crisis to another. And so what happens, we need to be mindful, even as a church, that single parents did not necessarily choose that path. You see, what happens is, if we, see, if we do not see it as the, the circumstances that some people face, how many times have we been insensitive to folks without ever putting ourselves in their place? And the church doesn't know how to deal with it. Because every time that kid gets in trouble, the parents feel the brunt. So you bring a, a child to church and uh, maybe the father's not as involved. And so as the parent, as the single mother, and there are some cases where the family is raised by a single father. But in most cases, it's a single mother holding it down. And so you are the one who have to comfort the child. But you're the one who also have to discipline the child. And so sometimes the child gets confused because they expect nurture when it's time for discipline. And so you now have to also deal with their attitude. And sometimes their issues have nothing to do with you. 
So single parents, as I say to single mothers, even if the guy has mistreated you uh, and walked off, you still have to be so careful of not making him an enemy because the boy you are raising will turn around and resent you. That father can disappear for years. Nobody knows where he is. I've never paid any bills. But that child still has a yearning. Where is my father? They still have a yearning to be reconnected with that parent. And so you and I have got to be wise and not allow the devil to use even your emotions to become your worst enemy. It means feeling stuff that you can't tell the children. The idea is because whether you are um, a, a two parent or a single parent, you still have the same mission to raise up healthy children who love God. So you may have to do double duty, and that is why the church, and I, when I say the church, it, it includes all of us. That many times, single parents have felt awkward. We make them treat, feel sometimes like the third wheel. So we show up as couples. We plan activities for couples. We get together as couples. So when that single parent shows up, how many of us ask the question, could we pay for child support? Could we pay for child care? So your child can be in a safe environment so you can get a breather for yourself. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I was thinking about that the other day. I said, God, I mean, as God has been kind of speaking to my heart. Because when we go over to Ebenezer, I can already tell you, the majority of folks who will live in the towers will be single parents. Yeah. Single parent is now the highest ranking household in our country. That means there are more single parents than there are two-parent homes. It means that the church can no longer stand on that side and say something is wrong with you. We've got to become a part of the solution by stepping in with compassion. And by the way, not every, you know, because sometimes when we don't understand the facts, we blame the victim. So when that person shows up, now, here's what happens when that person shows up at church and they're trying to keep those three kids together or those four kids together or regardless of their number. The, the last thing you want to be suggesting, well, didn't you know about um, contraceptives? <laughs> See, sometimes we judge a situation, but every life, every life is a gift from heaven. Every life has a promise over that child. And we need to see these children as promising. In other words, don't despise the child just because of the parent status. You know, one of the things um, I would often uh, remind, even when our children were in high school, I, I would make sure I, I show up at the high school. I, um, parent teachers meeting was, I'm like, okay, I mean, many times Di and I would go, but if Di can't, it's all no problem because in my mind as a black father, I need to be there. Because even when your children are raised in a two-parent home, many times folks assume that they just have a mother. So I said to the fathers, you have to know when to show up. You have, because here's what happened. This, when they know that you're in the home, they treat your children differently. When there's a problem, you can't stay home, brother, and say to your wife, why don't you go up to the school? You got to put on a suit. You got to show up. You don't have to say much. Just smile and say, I'm here. If, if this child needs me, I'm here. And amazingly enough, the message you send, you don't have to verbalize it. Just your very presence sends a message. And so here's what happens. And so we have been looking, as, uh, as we were looking more at the family, that as a church in this season and time, the church can no longer... Just give an answer from, uh, a proposed answer from the pulpit. We have to get in the mess. We got to get in the situation and provide support. So I, I, before I go further, I just, I want to at least um, encourage um, our single parents with a few words. 
and remind them that in spite of their situation, that there is still a place where the church recognized the need and the value to come alongside as partners. So one of the, one of the interesting things, even talking to a few single parents, is that single parents in many ways have a shortage of support and friendships. Most of their relationships are tied around their children. And so to just have a support, not just of other singles, but sometimes couples as well. Most single parents are physically and mentally exhausted. So even at work, who is pressed upon to work the overtime? Sometimes the assumption is you don't have a life because you're single. And so in many cases, we find where single parents are physically and, and, and mentally exhausted. We also find that most single parents struggle with guilt. So you may be married, you have a child, then the marriage falls apart, and you blame yourself for years that what could I have done to save the marriage so that my child could have two parents? And sometimes... The, the kid takes advantage of that and use the guilt. Oh, it was your fault. And so the idea is because the parent is already highly sensitive to guilt, they can be easily manipulated. We also un understand that single parents feel awkward many times in church activities. They feel that they will be judged because sometimes of unwed motherhood or sometimes they're blamed because of the label upon them. And the idea is that the church has got to take our heads out of the sand and face the situation. So my friends, here's the first thing I want us to learn from this situation is number one, regardless of your status, Hagar experienced God, not only in his omnipotence, and not only in his omnipresence, but also in his omniscient as the God who possesses all knowledge. So when we say God is omniscient, we're saying that God knows everything, that nothing takes God by surprise. And so here's the amazing thing, that we, we can experience God as omniscient in his personhood. Yet the Greeks can, um, use the word theos, the word which comes from the root word that that means the one who sees the very concept of deity revolves around the fact that God is everywhere at all times and nothing takes him by surprise. The idea is not only in his personhood but in his presence. Can I say to somebody today, God was busy this morning. I, I, I said God was busy this morning. I mean God was holding up the universe. I mean, God was making sure that the galaxy stayed in place. God was making sure that the sun rises on the right time and the moon goes on and that the world continues to rotate on its axis. Why? How do I know it's busy? Because he not only created the world, but he preserves it. The idea is, and God, can I talk to somebody today? And so God, in his busyness, while he's watching on one side of the hemisphere, he's also keeping stuff in order on the other side. Now, now you may be saying, well, well, but, but pastor, what's going on in the Ukraine? Can I tell you, God has an uncanny sense of humor because Putin thought he would have just walked right into Ukraine and just liberate uh, and just take control. But what he never understood, that God had already put in the Ukrainians a resilience to push back. Oh, hear me tell Hey, sometimes your enemy expects you to roll over and the last thing they can ever imagine is that God puts resilience on the end. So you may say, well, 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 why didn't God prevent the battle? Sometimes God's power is not in preventing it. It's God's power is to step in it. Oh, to, oh my God. You see, when the children of him, when the three Hebrew boys 
When the three were boys were thrown in the fire, you and I would say, well, 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 when Moses walked up to the Red Sea, he just stretched the rod and God just parted the waters. When they got to the bitter water, Mara, they just threw the twig in and it just converted bitter water to sweet water. When you say, well, God, where were you? When the Nebuchadnezzar was threatening Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where were you? When he was making the fire seven times hotter, where were you? When Nebuchadnezzar was making mockery of you, God, where were you? When they took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and threw them in the fire, God, where was, where were you? He says, I've been where I've always been. I've been right here. So when they threw them in the fire, God just stepped in the fire. The idea is, ah, whatever you're facing this morning, God is already in it. <laughs> Hear me today, that when they threw in the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire, and they says, wait here a minute, we threw three in. How can we see four? What they never understood, that we're God. Oh my God. God shows up, and he doesn't need your permission. God doesn't need a green card, and he doesn't need an entry visa. God just has a way of just bra breaking barriers, and just stepping up wherever he chooses and when they threw them in the fire God stepped in the fire and when he stood in the fire here's the amazing thing the fire did not stop burning but something happened the fire could no longer consume as a matter of fact they began to have worship every time in the fire because the Bible says when they're looking at the furnace, they were not standing there, they were having a Holy Ghost party. Can I say to somebody today, the worst thing you can do to your enemy is when they throw you in the fire and they're expecting you to be consumed, is to raise up your hallelujah and begin to sing a praise outside. Yeah, this is, oh my God, the reason the reason some of us, our worship has never reached a significant temperature. The, you know, the other day, uh, uh, we opened the fridge door and we just noticed something strange. Because when you open the fridge door, usually you feel the cold coming out. But we noticed something was wrong. Nothing was going on. There's not the stillness. There's no sense of coldness so we called in the tech folks they came in and they did whatever they needed to do and the next thing light comes on and you and all of a sudden, you feel the temperature rising. Here is what God wants us to understand. The reason so many of us have never experienced even worship on a significant temperature. We have never seen him working in a deep fire, honey, that seemed like it was meant to destroy you. And here's what happens. is that when they threw them in the fire and expect them to be consumed, instead... They're having church in the fire. Oh, you don't know what can we tell? The best kind of church is not when you just got a promotion. The best kind of church is not when you have money in the bank. The best kind of worship is when your bank account levels out. The best kind of worship is when you feel your body going through changes. But somewhere on the inside, you begin to feel a praise. Like Jeremiah says, I feel like fire. Shut up in my bones. That's when you know. It's not emotion, honey. It's not because of the music. This is fire rising from the very bone of my system, which is a reminder that God can show up anywhere. So you see what happens is. So the psalmist, the psalmist said, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You comprehend my paths and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but Lord, oh God, you know it. You have hedged me around and laid your hand upon me. He says such knowledge is too wonderful. It is high. I cannot attain it. 
He says, come on, tell me here, brother. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the winds of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part, even there your hand shall lead me. And uh, what the psalmist is saying, it doesn't matter my situation. It doesn't matter my location. It doesn't matter my aspiration. God, I said, God, it's right in the midst. To what Hagar discover is not only the personhood of God and the power of God, but Abraham, this um, Hagar discovers the power of God. The power of God. You see, it's in Matthew chapter 10, it tells us, Are not two sparrows so far apart, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. He literally knows. I was trying to test that Andre a couple of days ago. He literally knows the number of hair on your head. No, he doesn't say there's 500. That's the amount. He says, the scripture says, he knows the very number. That means he knows number one number two, number three, number four, if he knows the very number of here on your head, what he's saying to you is, as my children, if I can protect a sparrow, if I can, no, a sparrow is not the most, I mean, they're literally a sparrow is as common, common bird. So when somebody says you're as cheap as a sparrow, it means you're worth nothing. And God said, if I can be as concerned for the sparrow, much more. The idea is, whether you are a single parent or a two-parent home, whatever situation you find yourself in, you are still on God's radar. And as long as you are on his radar, honey, as long as you are on his, you are, you're in the palm of my hand, it, not even the devil can touch you without me giving him permission. The idea is that God, God has placed a hedge around you. So when you and I talk about the eyes of God, it is not just in a condemning way. It's also in a consoling way. He's a God who watches over us. But when you look at the fact, his omniscience really also has consequences because it is a personal, God has a personal knowledge of you. Can you imagine, of all the billions of folks on the face of the earth, God knows you intimately. Yeah. See, what, 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 when I, what, I remember even as a young, a young Christian, when you messed up, what did we do? We stayed away from church. When we messed up, we ran from God. Well, if he saw the mess before you got into it, if he, got, if he saw the situation before you stepped into it and he still loves you, yeah. we have got to break, dismantle this false notion that God loves us because we're good church people. God doesn't love you because you go to church. God doesn't love you because you're a tither. God doesn't love you just because you give the poor. God loves you because you are his creation. Oh my God. And it means that even when you mess up, he still loves you. We have got, no, I know, I know, I know. Sometimes we're afraid to preach about the love of God because we're afraid people may use it as license. But the idea is folks function out of maturity. That's why Paul was able to say to the Romans, shall we come? continue in sin that grace may be about God forbid the idea is when we were new new Christians it's one thing but as you grow in God you and I should get to a place where we recognize God knows me he knows what I'm thinking he knows where I fell the fell, fell through the pathway but in every stage of my life I am still where in the palm of his hands God has a personal knowledge of us the idea is God God makes home calls. 
I know the old doctors used to come and make home visits. Um, now we have, we can, we can get medical advice on our Google. Some of us, if we just start coughing, we start on Google. Uh, what's the sign of COVID? So some of us now, the internet has become our doctors. But if the, the point I want for us to know is that God has a personal concern about you. If your job is going through uncertainty, your marriage is in turmoil, your children are going crazy, regardless of what you're facing, God has a personal concern for you. And here's what happened, folks. You and I have got to get to a place where even if nobody calls you, you know that God is still there for you. If nobody mentions your name, you know that God is still there for you. And here's what happens. God, God, not only has a perfect, uh, uh, he has a personal um, knowledge. God has a perfect knowledge of us. You know, I go to the doctor and he wants to do the different check cardio he wants to do this he gets the x-ray he, he wants to do uh, he wants to see what's going on on the inside well i want you to know with god dr jesus doesn't need an x-ray machine he doesn't need to do any cardio tests he knows the blood pressure he knows the sugar level he knows what's going on in the body and here's the amazing thing that's why the psalmist said this kind of knowledge is too awesome it means that whatever I'm facing God has it in control and so my friends you and I may be in a place where it feels as if the road is longer than we have the strength you and I may be looking at our circumstances today and we can't find the light at the end of the tunnel. But I'm here to say to you by faith that when you walk by faith, you don't need to see the light. When you walk by faith, you just need to trust the God who is still in control because in the midst of your walk, he, oh my God. So to that single parent who's trying to raise a young boy through the teenage years, he may want to come home when he wants to. He may want to go out when he wants to. He may have friends that make you uncomfortable. He may do evil even dangerous or self-harming activities. To the young girls, sometimes you find that a broken home also predisposes or exposes them to activities which may be self-harmful. But I've come to say by the word of God that there's a tool in your arsenal. It's not your argument and it is not how you it's not how you scream. There is a tool in your arsenal. It is called prayer. Then, oh my God, I want you to understand that prayer can reach through the name. Prayer can reach over the miles. Prayer can do things. So when the kid, don't get into a fight. I know sometimes our patience runs out. And we say to that kid, you can't take my instructions. Well, I'm going to close the door and I'm going to leave you on the streets. But I want you to know that even when your patience feels stretched, even when you feel like you don't have the strength to go to the next police precinct, to try to explain anything. I'm here to say to somebody today that the grace of God is sufficient. Right now it may feel as if it is stretching you, but God can still hold you together. Sometimes you wonder, it may feel, oh God, I want you to know, sometimes I cannot even understand the pain. You know, I, 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 I remember in the mid, uh, I think it was in COVID, as we were going through the COVID situation, and, and, and uh, you know, we get hypersensitive. 
and we want to be careful. And, and, and so, um, Di and I were supposed to go to some event, and uh, my kids called an emergency meeting. And um, they're going to, no, 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 uh, no, we are. And they're like, no. And we're like, wait, wait, wait. I know this is what's going on, but and we are defend, we're trying to explain our case. And they're like, no, 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 we want you guys to be safe. And then I realized some seniors lost their privilege. <laughs> with COVID. I mean, some, some seniors lost their driving privileges. Uh, maybe your kids came and said, no, you're not going back out to church until COVID is over. Or some well-meaning grandchild who is your guardian may give you all the stats. Why folks are dropping dead after going to church. But whatever reason, that quest to protect. And I want you to know, that's not a bad thing. Because there are some parents whose kids don't even check on them. There are some grandparents who don't know it. So when you have a child that checks on you, it is a blessing. But, but oh, I, as we were having that conversation, I, I, I looked at them and I said, now, can we just turn the script for a little while? Okay, dad, it's your time. I said, when we used to have those arguments, when you used to go out sometimes and stay a little late and come home whenever you want to, do you understand that we were laying out here all night wondering what and I, I know I know when you came in the house you may have thought we were asleep we were not asleep we were lying there watching the clock wondering oh God it is time for them to come home and while you were out there we could not sleep but can I say to somebody today can I say to somebody today that there is a sense that God, the God who cares for us, the God who watches over us, the God who protects us, that even when you're going through your difficult time, I hear the writer says, he neither slumbers nor sleep. He's always watching over us. Can I say to somebody today, wherever you are in your journey, God is still watching over you. Here's what happens. If you're suffering, I know sometimes we can't be transparent and church is a place you can't even tell stuff because folks take one part and they spring it and when you hear it again, it sounds completely different. But I, I, I want you to know that what gave me an appreciation, as a matter of fact, I think what has helped me to be a better father is the own, my own journey with my father. Uh, I think what has given me a great appreciation for single parents is because of, I, I remember at one point my parents were pastoring, so I, I'm coming home, oh my God, my father would come and pick us up at school. Oh, we were the envy of some school kids. Your father have a car, you must be doing well. <laughs> Even if it is taped together. Well, okay. Uh, but the fact that you had a father in the home, that put us on the status. And then I remember when, when my parents moved to England, uh, my father went first and then we were, we were living. And I, I remembered um, we, were, uh, we were living in Jordan's Plain, uh, where Sister Ivy is from. And so we had pastored that church before. And so here we are trying to relocate because uh, most people don't understand when you're a pastor and you live in the parsonage, when your assignment over, you need to find a place to live. So I have a phobia. I can't live in church parsonage. I got to live in a place where my kids can mess it up. I got to live in a place where nobody can come and show up unexpectedly for an inspection. And furthermore, if tomorrow I have a stroke and I can't walk, nobody can say to die, you got to find another house. So I have my own issue. That's not your issue. But I needed to have my own house with my kids living. And, and, and so I remember after my dad went to England, and so my mom is home, and, she, and so we're, we're at school, and, and, and um, there were some 
East Indian mango trees on the neighbor's lot. And I mean, those, those, they, I mean, those mangoes, they were just fantastic. But the problem is you had to reap them within a certain time because if they stayed on the tree too long, they begin to have worms. Oh, I, I wish I had some honest folks. So you got to cut out, cut out the worms. So, so, so th those East Indian mango trees. And so we would be walking home. We walked to school like five miles, one way. There was no snow, otherwise I would tell you in the snow. <laughs> but we walked to school. And at the end of the day, all four of us got together and we walked back four miles home. And so when we got home, um, I remember my, my mom told us um, years later, because she went over to the neighbor's house neighbor's um, lawn and started picking up some of these mangoes that many had already become infected. Yeah. So that means you have to cut off one side, yeah. cut off any sign of blemish. And so as she's picking up these mangoes, knowing she had four kids on their way from school, the neighbor says, do you have animals? <laughs> because he thought she was picking up the mangoes to feed and she says, um, no, I just have a few kids. <laughs> and so when we got home, she would take those mangoes, cut out the, 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 and she could blend anything, honey. She would just put those mangoes and blend and we would have mango punch. <laughs> uh, the next thing, the neighbor across the street um, was a retired teacher, and she had some breadfruit trees. And so she didn't have any one. So she would say, Miss Nelson, can you have one of your boys pick the breadfruits? And so we would, uh, my brother or I would pick enough breadfruits. She would get some and she would give us some. Um, she had a star apple tr um, tree that just bore star apples. Uh, my mom went over and she gathered all these star apples. I mean, we had star apples for breakfast, lunch. We had star apples for, for I mean, we had, we had everything you could do with, with, with star apples. But, but here's the point, because some of us have deprived our children of the truth of how we were raised. We talk about the polished things. And we talk about all the things. We have never told them about the suffering. And so then when they grow up in their own room, have their own television, have access to telephone, and they have all of this, they think it has always been like that. But can I tell you something? There is nothing. How do you know that there's a God who sees? Because when you look back and see where he brought you, you from when you saw what he brought you through you knew it had to be the grace of God it wasn't your intellect it wasn't your resources it wasn't your ability it was God who can okay give up here he is having folks when you know where God has brought you from, money doesn't get to your head. What you tribe doesn't get to your head. Where you live doesn't get to your head. Because you know God has been good and God has been faithful. And if God could have brought us to where we are today, there is no situation we face that God is not able. That God is not able. That God is not able. The word said, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the hearts of man. What God. So if you don't have a second paycheck to put with yours. And if you don't have anybody coming home from work. Telling you what a great job you're doing. If you don't have anybody who's coming and pouring back into you. I have news for you, honey. As long as God is with you, as long as God is with you, it doesn't matter how long the journey becomes. God will carry you through. President Obama is speaking of his mother says that everything he knew he was taught by his mother raised by a single mother in a biracial family as the one who stood out here's what happens folks God has a way 
of using what looks to work against you and God will turn it around and use the very thing to work for you. So though he was raised by a single mother and has a story to tell, when he walked into the White House as the first black president of the United States, you can even see the way he dotes over his daughters that this man understood what it is to dream of a family. As we stand together, I was thinking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, who had to explain a birth which predated her wedding day. Mary, who with Joseph raised their children but when Jesus hung on the cross, it is believed that Joseph had already died. And so she didn't have Joseph there to hug her and to comfort and to support her. To some degree, she represents a single mother who watched her son being crucified, who watched her son killed before her very eyes but because of her faith she knew it was not the end I, I know we're still trying to work with the restrictions of COVID but I feel in my heart that God wants to pour back into a number of single parents in this church I believe that God wants to whisper in the ear of a parent trying to raise their children during the most vulnerable times of their lives that your issue doesn't have to scar this child you don't have to let your disappointment and your own pain when we talk about Jabez we know that Jabez by his very name was born in a difficult situation. You don't have to allow your circumstances to define or identify your children. One single mother, as she tried to describe the pain of being a single mother, she says, sometimes when I look at the boy and I don't see the boy, I see his father who walked away from me. She said one day the boy did something crazy and she was punishing him. She said it publicly. She said, I started beating my son for a minor infraction. And she said, I lost complete control while I was beating him. Somebody had to pull her bodily off the young boy. She said, it's almost like she snapped. And I want you to know, folks, that when you talk to some people and they describe what they have been through, it blows your mind that they're not in some mental asylum. It, it, it literally amazes me that God, by his grace, can hold us together when we have gone through some difficult season. And I want you to know, as a church, God is calling us to extend compassion even when we don't understand the details. I want us to bow our heads. And we're going to pray. And I want you to know that as we navigate, last week um, we started the couples class. We have, what, 42 couples in the couples class. But building a couples class is not at the expense of those who are single parenting. We're all in this together. So at some point, we want to look at a support group for single parents. We want to look at a support group where the church can provide care for the ch um, child care service. And we can take those single parents, we can take them maybe into Manhattan, do some activity. We want to do less talking and more actions. We want to show by our action, not by our words, 
that God has a plan for every family unit. Whether you're a two-parent, whether you're a single parent, or even if you're a single adult living on your own, hoping for one day that God will bless you with marriage, God is still concerned about you. And so I want us to take a few moments as we pray, believing that just as Hagar experienced God as the God who sees, El Roy, the God who sees, you also can experience him just where you are. Father, we want to lift every single parent, whether in the building or on the e-church platform. God, you know the pain, you know the struggles. Sometimes even in the public when there's a smile on our face, there's a broken heart that's hidden. Today I pray, Father, for the comforting touch of your spirit. I pray for the God who provides, that God, you'll open doors, you'll release resources. God, for single parents who feel as if they are trapped, literally feel that they have lost the independence of their life because of their duty to raise the next generation. Will you give grace? And I pray, help us as a church to indeed be a place of restoration, a place of recovery, and a place of support. And when we are tempted to be judgmental, when we are tempted to look down on others because of their status, when we are tempted to treat others as less than, would you touch our hearts? And may the compassion of Jesus Christ flow to others in this difficult season. I pray for those in the hearing of my voice who may be facing circumstances today which leaves them feeling overwhelmed. People who may feel as if all hope is gone. This morning I ask Holy Spirit, would you touch our hearts and remind us that God is still in control. That God is still at work in the affairs of mankind. And that God will see us through. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I need to accept Jesus Christ. I want to lead a life submitted to Jesus Christ. Just raise your hands where you are. If you're in this house or you're on the e-church platform, I want you to know, friends, Today, the fact you're in this house or listening to this sermon is not by chance. Nothing takes God by chance. And I want you to know it doesn't matter how messed up your life has been. It doesn't matter the mistakes you may have made. It doesn't matter how many times you may have fallen. God still loves you. God wants to bring you to a place where your life is in alignment to his will so you can indeed experience the abundant life. Someone will be in the ministry room from the outreach team. We want to pray with you. We want to walk with you. We want to help you in your walk with the Lord. You don't have to walk alone. We're here to walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people say, May God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people say, Amen. give God a praise offering. You may be seated.